All right, here we go. We have wrestling royalty in the building. Jake the Snake Roberts, welcome to Vlad TV. Oh, thank you for letting me be here. Oh, absolutely, man. I'm a longtime fan. I oh, grew I up watching that. you on WWF. Yeah, those were some good years. They were. They were. Okay, well, this is our first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you grew up in Texas. Right. But what part? Gainesville, Texas. That's North Texas, about 60 miles north of Dallas. Okay. And what was that like in the 60s and 70s? Pretty rough around my house. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of bullshit going on, you know. My father wasn't a good man. He was a pedophile. Um, raped my mother when she was 12 years old. Uh, I was born. And the next four years, they had three more. They had three kids. He divorced her at the age of 17. <laughs> and uh, left. You know, and... Uh, of course, 17 years old in the 60s, you, you're not going to raise a family on a wait, waitress's wages, you know. And uh, so we got split up. My mom wound up uh, living with my grandmother on my father's side and my grandfather, who was a hopeless alcoholic. Uh, he drank a fifth of whiskey every day, seven days a week. That's that's what he did, you know. And... Uh, it was pretty rough. Well, you've told the story before, so I want to yeah. I want to get it, get into it a little bit. So, your father was actually dating your grandmother, right? Initially, right. Okay, she passed out. And, and he went in a different room and raped a twelve year old. Yeah, that, that's crazy. How much older was he than your mother? Oh, twelve years old. Twelve years. He okay, was, so she was 12 and he was 24? Right. Wow. Okay. And then he actually married your mother yeah. after she got pregnant. Yeah. Okay, so she was, what, like 13 and he was 25? Yeah. I mean, how does a 25-year-old marry a 13-year-old? Hey, it was the 60s, man. It was the 60s. You know? It was, okay. It, it was, it was uh, living in the country, you know? Yeah. Okay, so then he got married, and they had two more kids. So it was right. three kids total. Right. And then when she was 17, he divorced her. Right. He went on the road. Okay. He took off. <laughs> right. So then, what, you went to go live with your, well, your mother moved in with your grandmother? Right. Okay. Uh, but then... Your grandmother passed away. Correct. When I was when I was thirteen, she passed away. Okay, and by then my mother by then my mother had remarried, and right. uh, she had moved out. Of course, uh, my sister was living with my father. He because he had remarried, and by then my my little brother was given away at birth to my aunt. Yeah my dad's uh, sister. So we were all split up and scattered. And uh, when my grandmother died, there was no way for me to stay with my grandfather because he was a drunk. You know, he had been in a real bad oil field accident in the 1930s and he crushed his legs. And uh, he was in the hospital for like a year and a half and they just kept re-breaking his legs trying to get him right. The whole time he was hooked up to morphine. So when they got him well, <laughs> they kicked him out the door. He had, a little, he had a little twitch in his walk, you know. He needed a little something to get him going. And so he turned to alcohol. So he drank a fifth every day. So I couldn't stay right. there. So I wound up going to live with my father. And that was, that was a big mistake. Right. And, and before then, you said your mother had remarried. Right. And you actually had a good relationship with your stepfather, right? Yes, yes. But then he got electrocuted? Yeah, that was not till later on, though. Okay, got it. Much later. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so you went to go live with your biological father right. at that point. But then a whole new type of abuse started. Yeah, that's when it really got sick. 
Yeah, my stepmother started abusing me sexually. Uh, she'd make me perform, and she'd beat me afterwards. It was pretty bad. I was 13 years old, and she was only 20 at the time because my father had found him another young girl, you know. He seemed to have that thing about him. He had to have young girls. And uh, later on, we found out that it didn't matter if they were his own, you know, because he, he raped both of his daughters, too, so. Right. So he was molesting his biological daughters yeah. as well. Yeah. And then your your sister, one of those daughters. Yeah. At 18 years old, she married a 55-year-old man. Right. Trying to find daddy. Yeah. Daddy and issues, basically. That didn't work out too well for her a year later. She had had a baby, and um, she was kidnapped and murdered by her husband's ex-wife. Um, they never, they never, she never paid the price for murder because they never found the body. But there was enough blood in the trunk of the car to know that my sister didn't survive. Right. So the ex-wife who killed your sister ended up going to prison for 10 years for kidnapping. Right. Because they couldn't pin the murder on her because right. there was no body. Correct. And then she got out 10 years later and got back together with Yep. with the husband. Yep. And they disappeared somewhere in Mexico. Yeah. So so the body was never recovered. No. Yeah. But there was a huge life insurance policy that had to be paid off. Huh. On my on my sister. What, what what happened to their baby? Well, it's my nephew. He's in prison right now. For what? Uh, theft. Drugs. He's tormented. He's got a lot on his mind. Uh, he's just uh, screwed up, man. Okay, so here you are growing up in this crazy environment yeah you're going to high school yeah. uh, you play football you play football in high school football i wasn't that good at football my best sport was baseball i could okay. i could really pitch well and you were actually the first person in your family that graduated, graduated high graduated high school yeah okay and initially you wanted to go to college right yeah i wanted to be an architect uh, but your father was actually a known wrestler. Very famous, yeah. My father was much larger than me. He was seven foot. Seven foot and weighed 425 pounds. Huge man. Right. Uh, uh, Grizzly? Grizzly yeah. Smith? Grizzly Smith. Okay. So, as a kid, did you have any aspirations to be a wrestler? Absolutely not. I hated wrestling. I blamed, I blamed wrestling for all the problems at home. I blamed wrestling saying, well, the reason my dad can't be with me is because he has to wrestle, you know? And uh, that wasn't it at all. He didn't want a family. Right, because even when he graduated high school, your dad didn't show up. He never showed up for graduation. He never showed up for a ball game. He never showed up for shit, man. And, you know, when I graduated from high school, I went down to see him, you know, to, just to tell him, hey, I made it, you know. Because all I ever wanted out of him was for him to say, I'm proud of you, son, you know. I think every kid needs that. But when I went down there, he's like, well, I hope you don't want any money from me. I don't have anything to give you. And I'm like, you know, you haven't given me anything yet. Why would I expect anything now, you know, but... um a couple of nights later, I was uh, I went to one of the shows and um, started drinking beer, which I've been drinking for some time, and um, got a little tipsy. And then my brain, in all of its wisdom, thought, "Well, if I want my dad to be proud of me, I should get in the ring and beat up a wrestler. Then he'll have to be proud of me." which at the time it seemed like a great idea, you know, I just didn't consider that wrestler might not want to be a part of that, you know? And when I got in the ring, he tore my ass a new one, man. He wore me out. 
And uh, I couldn't even walk back to the locker room. I had to crawl because uh, the guy had really done a number on me. And uh, my father met me at the door and he just looked down at me and said, I'm ashamed of you, you're gutless and you'll never amount to anything. I remember, I remember those three words, man, just like a dagger in my heart. And I remember that night going home and just saying, you know, praying to the devil, praying to God, whoever would listen, I'll do anything it takes to be the best wrestler ever, to be better than my father. Well, you were 19 when you had that first wrestling match? Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, did you get married at 18? Yeah. Okay. Why so young? Pregnancy. Hmm. There you go. Doing the right thing. Okay. You had your first child, uh, your daughter. Correct. I mean, what was it like to be a, a teenage dad at that point without, I mean, because there was really no career yet, right? No. It was tough. It was tough. I didn't start out wrestling. I started out refereeing, so at least there was money coming in. You know, we had money. That, was, that wasn't a problem. But, um, yeah, it was real tough, man learning to be a father and uh it wasn't the best situation man the lady that i married she she's a great woman but um we had nothing in common you know should okay, have gotten so he, married okay so here you are a new dad newly married you're trying to start this new career you start out as refereeing but you actually then progress to actually wrestling doing yeah. wrestling on the on the indie circuit right essentially and you're going to small towns and you're yep. starting to you know get your feet wet yep uh i guess you were at in stampede wrestling originally i went up to uh well, i went to several places first yeah, i went to florida went all over tennessee uh georgia then I went up to British Columbia. It was my first break, so to speak. That's when you move up the card to the main event. Uh, and I moved up the card to the main event. Then I went over to Calgary and stayed there for, well, eight, ten months. That was the main event the whole time there. And then I came back down south to Louisiana, Mid-South Wrestling. Okay, and then by 1982, you got divorced. Yeah. You had, you had said in, a, in your documentary that being on the road kind of messed up your sex life because you're having threesomes yeah, and everything else like that. It did, man, because uh, I was foolish and, uh, you know, I wanted to try everything. And I did. <laughs> and uh, I tried multiple partners at the same time. And, uh, you know, when when your mind and body gets used to that, that's kind of what you like and what you want. Well, it's kind of hard to go back home and be straight with mama, you know? And you kind of get there and you kind of come up short, whatever it's time to, to deliver, you, you're not excited. You know, you got, you got to have much more than this to be excited. And uh, here's a baby crying over here in the corner and you're thinking, well, what can I do? You can't do shit. Now, that's my... One of my big regrets. Okay. So you're continuing your wrestling career. Uh, in 83, you joined the Georgia Championship Wrestling right. Association. Um, you became part of the Legion of Doom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then by the next year, you joined the World Class Champion Championship Wrestling Yeah, with the Magic Dallas. Okay. So... You joined the WCCW. Yep. And you got remarried in 84. Yep. To uh, Cheryl uh, Haygood? Right. right. Okay. How was the second marriage? Much better. Um, it lasted for about 10 years. And then the addiction just took over my life. And uh, we had had three children by then and uh she gave me a choice you know you gotta quit doing the drugs and the alcohol because i don't want to raise the children in a home like that and um gave me a choice and i chose drugs and alcohol man you know my drug was more important than any marriage 
at the time. Well, well, the alcohol started early, right? Yeah. But when did when did the actual drugs show uh, up? The cocaine started probably in 87, 88. But by 90, by 95, 96, man, it had a hold of me good. You know, it was really messing with me. So it, it was downhill from there. Okay, and we'll get into that, you know, in, in more in depth as we go along with the story. Um, well, like I said, you got married in 84. Yeah. Uh, in 85, uh, you returned to Mid-South Wrestling. Right. And was it around that time that the DDT move came yeah. around? Yeah, that's when it got invented. By accident. Okay. By accident. Okay, and DDT is actually uh, a chemical. Correct. Was it, is it rat poison or? Yeah, it was, they, farmers were using it and it was getting into the food chain. And they found right. out that it's, it gives uh, serious brain issues. Right. It actually stands for dichlorodiphenyl trichlory, dichlor, dichloro. Ethane. Exactly. And that's exactly why I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I called D it DDT. <laughs> DDT for short, a.k.a. Yeah, right. the end. <laughs> okay. And that's a move where you basically, you know, the person's head first, you drop them and they, they fall on their, on their head. Yeah, basically. you drive your head right through the mat. Okay. And how did it come around by accident? Well, I had a guy hooked in that position and I was just wrenching on him and he went to push me backwards and when he did he stepped on my foot so I was I was caught and I just fell and it drove his head into the mat and the people just went oh and I'm like damn that must be something and after that I just started working with it trying to figure it out and I figured it out. And it's probably the most used wrestling hole of all time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, by 1986, that's when you joined the WWF. Right. So how did that come about? Phone call. You know, uh, I had quit Mid-South over some disagreements. And... Uh, I called Vince McMahon. He told me to get on the airplane and come up there. And when I did, the rest is just, uh, I signed a piece of paper and we were off and running, man. But I didn't right, know, now, I didn't want anything to do with no damn snake, you know, uh, but that was part of the idea and uh, that I would use it. Right. Now, Vince McMahon, his dad actually owned the WWF initially, right. but it was more of a regional kind yeah. of wrestling association. Right. When he took it over, he turned it into an international phenomenon. Worldwide, yeah. Uh, by 86, how big was the WWF? Oh, it was crazy, man. You couldn't go anywhere. The people everywhere knew you. The airports would be jammed with you. Uh, you couldn't walk the streets, man. You couldn't go nowhere. It was that hot. Right. And it did not matter what arena we went into. It was sold out. You know, and it, it was it was insane to to go from mid south where you had say a thousand people or twelve hundred people in an arena or maybe even five thousand in an arena to go from that to WWF and you've got fifteen thousand in every arena. I mean, they were all sold out. Sacramento, it didn't matter. Tacoma, didn't matter. Calgary, didn't matter. All the largest buildings, and we sell out every damn one of them, man. And we were running seven days a week, mm. twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, which took a hell of a toll. Now, were you Jake the Snake at that point? Was that your name? I was Jake the Snake probably from 1979 on. Okay. I was Jake the Snake before I ever started carrying a snake. Got it. But when Vince McMahon called, he said, I want you to carry a snake. Yeah. Had you carried a snake before then? Never. I'm, I'm terrified of snakes. Okay. So that was just his own little brainchild. Well, I'd had the idea myself 
a couple of years before, but uh, the owner of Mid South said that was you know, ridiculous. We're not, we're not going to have a damn circus out there. What the hell you think this is wrestling? Oh, sorry, didn't mean to go there. Okay, so you actually didn't even want to do the snake, but then there was a big check associated with it. Yeah, there was a, a promise of a lot of money. Yeah, so you were like, okay, I'm going to do the snake. Yeah, thing. I'm not afraid of them anymore. Okay, so you signed to WWF, and your first big bout was Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Yeah. Now... Originally, this thing was supposed to be planned, and you were supposed to do the DDT in the ring. No, they wanted it on the concrete. Oh, okay. So they wanted it on the concrete. Yeah, originally. I didn't want to do it. Right, because it's dangerous. Yeah, I knew. It, I knew it, it'd screw him up. Okay, but he actually was okay with doing it on the concrete. Yeah, he felt like he owed the the Booker at the time was a guy by the name of uh, Oh boy. Well, I can't remember his name anyway, but he, he thought he owed him a favor. And so he came to me and he said, come on, Jake, just do it for me. I owe this guy a favor and I want to repay him. And I said, man, we can't do it because it's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt you bad. And he, just, he was adamant about it, man. I said, okay, man, it's on you. And when we did it, I knew he was hurt because it sounded like somebody had dropped a watermelon on concrete. Just black, you know, and uh, that wasn't a good sound. And then when I went to pick him up, I found out that he was knocked out. Yeah, he got knocked unconscious, yeah. and he ended up uh, sustaining a concussion. Oh, because yeah, a serious concussion. His, his forehead swelled out four inches. It took two weeks for his eyes to turn black because all the swelling. But he asked for it, so he couldn't yeah, really get it. Yeah, he won't ask yeah. for it again. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I guess after that, uh, in order to combat the whole snake thing, he decided to bring a quote unquote Komodo dragon with him. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Right. It wasn't really a dragon though. No. No. no it was, was a, a, what was monitor, it? It was a little monitor, monitor, monitor lizard. Right. It was a, was it a crocodile though? At one no, point? no, 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 no. It was a monitor. Well, I saw him with a, I saw him with an actual crocodile though. No, it was a monitor point. lizard. Monitor lizard. Okay, yeah. my bad. Okay. Okay. So, what was it like at that point? Now you're you're in the big leagues. You're you you got big you know big matches. You're making more money. Everything else like that. Yeah, it, it's just flying too fast, going way too fast. You know the the money, uh, the women, the drugs, all of it was just coming at you too fast, man. Right, in that same year, you actually challenged uh, Macho Man Randy Savage for the championship, uh, which ended in a double disqualification. Yeah. But it kind of set off, you know, a it, thing that would happen later on. Later on, right. Yep. Set the table. Set the table, exactly. And uh, weren't you supposed to fight uh, Hulk Hogan around this time? Yeah, and uh, I did fight him twice, but... Uh... The fans cost me a lot of money because they were chanting DDT, DDT. And uh, that's not what they wanted, man, because, uh, you know, the big picture is not how many fans you put in an arena. It's how much how much you sell at the merchandising stores and stuff. And they didn't want the crowd split because it's just bad for business. So that's when they ichnayed me and uh, made me a baby face instead of a heel. Right. I mean, at the time, Hulk Hogan was kind of the face of the WWF, Yeah, right? he, he was he was the golden goose. Yeah. Was that around the same time he did the Rocky movie? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he was just a, a megastar at this point. Oh, movie. yeah, he was. Okay. And that same year, you had a match with the Honky Tonk Man. Yeah. And whose idea was it to, to hit you with a guitar? That was Vince's idea. It was a bad idea. Well, it was a bad guitar. Uh, they didn't get a prop guitar. They got a real guitar. The damn thing was a half an inch thick. And when he hit me, it blew out 
C6 and C7, which caused me a lot of problems because I, I, I wouldn't quit wrestling and get it fixed. I was too afraid. I was afraid it might all end. So I wrestled for two years with that injury, and that's when I started taking a lot of pills, man, to combat the pain. Right. You said that you were picking pieces of wood out of your back for weeks. Yeah, fiberglass. Okay. You can't that... see you can't see fiberglass, man. Yeah. It's just shivers of it. Was that your first major injury? Yeah. Well, what no, I'm not gonna say it was my first major injury because I'd I'd folded this wrist over to my forearm one time and I had to they had to open me up and reconstruct that and that took a year and a half off. So that was pretty major. But the neck injury was the one that, it wouldn't have been as bad as it was if I'd had the surgery done sooner. But because I was afraid to to get it done, because I was afraid they was gonna tell me I couldn't wrestle anymore, which is what they told me whenever I did have it done. But that didn't stop me. <laughs> now, your thing was whenever you would beat an opponent, you would put the, the snake on their face. Right. Whose idea was this? That was mine. That was yours. This is either put it in their face or shove it in their shorts. Okay. And this was a, a Burmese python that you yeah. use? Right. But you'd and actually remove the, you removed the venom. Well, they don't have venom. Oh, they don't have venom. Okay. No, so. they just, they wrap around you and crush you or cut your, your oxygen off to your brain and you'll pass out and then they swallow you. Okay, was there ever a problem with the snake? Did any oh, of the snakes God, actually yeah. try to... Okay, like what? Uh, I got around my neck one time in Indianapolis and choked me out during a match. Oh, uh, I was fighting Steamboat, and Steamboat had the lizard, and I had the snake, and it got around my neck and squeezed, and I went down, and Steamboat looked and seen that I was out, and he took the snake off of me. If not, I'd been dead. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty weird, man. I remembered that. <laughs> okay, so you're doing a lot of big matches, and that leads up to WrestleMania three. Yeah, Silverdome, nineteen eighty-seven. Uh, this was with Ravishing Rick Rude. No, that was eighty-seven. Was the Honky Tonk Man? Uh -huh. I wrestled him in front of ninety-four thousand people in Detroit. Uh, Rick Rude was the following year. I wrestled him in uh, Atlantic City which was a another one of those instances where we planted a seed. I wrestled him there, and then a couple of years later, he would go out to ringside and grab my wife, and then I'd come kick his ass, and he had his, he had his, he had my wife's picture on his pants right. on the crotch, and uh, I went down to ringside and ripped him off of him. Okay. All and sorts then that of silly shit happening. Right. And then next year, you actually got into a feud with Andre the Giant. Yes. Okay. And how tall was Andre the Giant? 7'5". Seven 7'5". Five. Seven five. Yeah. So he was taller than your dad. Oh, yeah. Taller. Yeah. Okay. So what was it like to, to wrestle with someone who's just one of the tallest men on earth, essentially? Oh, it was incredible, man. You know, I had so much respect for him. He was so powerful. He weighed over 500 pounds. And uh, there's no way in hell I'm going to beat this guy. <laughs> no way in hell. I was just praying that I survived it. Mm. That was my wish, that I'd just get out of there okay. But uh, it was quite the experiment, the experience for me. All right. And Andre was a, a big star in his own right. I mean, he was oh, yeah. the, Princess, the Princess Bride movie. Yeah. And I mean, just, yeah, I mean, just a big, He's a bigger big than celebrity. Life. Bigger He's than definitely life. bigger than life yeah. in more ways than one. What was he like off camera? Loved play cards. Mm. We would sit and play cards for hours. We'd play uh, cribbage. And uh, we played for big money. We played for a dollar a game. But it was more about pride, man. But uh, he, yeah, he was a quiet guy. Okay, and then 
by 1991, uh, that's when you actually had matches with the Ultimate Warrior. Well, we never had one. We were supposed to, but he got fired at SummerSlam. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Because he demanded a large payday. He got his payday, but he also got fired. Okay, well, that was when Ultimate Warrior was supposed to have matches with The Undertaker. Right. Okay, and that was a big deal in that world. Yeah, yeah, didn't happen because he got fired. Okay, and it was that same year, 1991, that you had the feud with Randy Savage. Right. And that was when you actually brought in a snake and things went kind of left. King Cobra. Right. Yeah, I hooked him up. <laughs> okay, so tell me about that whole situation. Well, the first thing that happened was Savage came to me and uh, said, hey, we're doing this thing tonight, man. He says, are you sure that snake's good? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, is this poison? Did you have his poison taken out? You know, and I'm like, yeah, man, he's straight. And he's like, well, crazier things have happened here in the WWF, so I don't believe you. So he made me hook the snake up to myself, let the snake bite me first. And then afterwards, he was okay at biting him. So uh, it bit him for quite a long time. Chewed on his arm pretty good. Right. So so the cobra latched onto his arm yeah. in the middle of the match. Wouldn't let go. Actually, and you could see the blood streaming yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. In the ring, you know, I mean, you see it on TV, but like, as you're dealing with him and he's looking at you, is he like kind of freaking out at this point? Oh, yeah. He was losing his shit, man. <laughs> okay. How did they finally get the snake off of him? I pried his mouth open. Uh-huh. Got it off of him. It right. was awesome. It was awesome. Right. Well, and even though the snake wasn't supposed to have any venom, Randy Savage's arm like swelled up, right? Yeah, a little bit from the being chewed on and everything. He might have got a little bit of infection. Okay. And uh, I guess the cobra died a week later? No, it didn't. No, that's that all that. Bullshit. <laughs> that was just part of the little story oh, there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and was it around that time that. Uh, the WWF uh, president, uh, Jack Tooney, actually said no more snakes in the ring? Yeah, he said something like that, but it was just a teaser. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was that the only time? I mean, because you would bring in pythons that would wrap right. around you, but, but was that the first time you brought in a cobra that would actually try to bite you? Uh, no, I brought it out in a few other matches, but it's the first time that I let it hook up on somebody. Okay. Did that happen again in, in future matches? Yeah, it happened to me. It bit me in the face. Damn. Okay, so so that happened. And then the whole Randy Savage uh, feud continued through 1992 into the Royal Rumble. What happened there? We just kept it going, man. He finally, he finally got the best of me and... Um... But it was a, we had some electric, electric, electric moments. We really did. Well, and that was your last match with the WWF for a few years, right? Yeah. Yeah, I left. And that was after WrestleMania. I wrestled The Undertaker in uh, Indianapolis for WrestleMania 8. And then immediately after the match, I, I was, I left. Okay. Was it because you're supposed to get a, a writing position in yep. the company? Yep. Didn't get what I was promised. Okay. And was that when like the drug use started to, you know, ramp up? Yep. You know, uh, you said that I spun out of control for the next 15 years. Yeah. All I cared about was how much cocaine I had. That's it. Was it around that time that the suicide attempts started yeah. happening? Yeah. Okay. So what happened the first time? I was just, uh, I 
I was at the end of the road, man. I'd had enough. I had enough of being alone. Uh, I'd had enough of disappointing my family, of hurting my children, hurting my wife. I just had enough. And uh, in a moment of uh, insanity, I, I decided to take a, a bottle full of Valium. And um, I took them, I went to sleep, but in my sleep I threw up. And um, I didn't choke on it, thank God. I remember waking up thinking, man, I'm such a loser, I can't even die right, you know? Which is insane to say, but that's how I felt. It wouldn't be the last time I tried, though. How many total attempts did you have? I think four. Okay. Tried, tried, tried to OD on cocaine, didn't work. <laughs> I just ran out of coke. <laughs> okay. Well, after leaving the WWF, then you joined the WCW. For a short time. Okay. And your dad was wrestling there as well? No, he wasn't wrestling there. He was just a uh, backstage handler. Okay. So did you guys actually work together while you were there or no? No. Okay. What was it like to have your dad around, though, during that time? I didn't want him around. Hmm. Okay. And around that time when you joined the WCW, there was supposed to be this huge payday for you. Yep. And I got screwed on that by Bill Watts. And that was the beginning of the end. Right, because weren't you making about three and a half million a year around that time? I should have been. Should have been. But he, he, he made me sign a contract for $1,000 a day. Hmm. Okay. So things started to get go downhill after that. Oh, yeah, real quick. At what point did you actually go from cocaine to crack? About that time. Okay. It was easier to get a hold of. Well, you know, you and I both grew up in the era where you saw the effects of crack on television and oh, yeah. you know, and everything else like that. You know, there was nothing cocaine was more of a glamorous kind of drug. Yeah, you know, maybe. this was like you know, I mean, at least the way it was, you know, depicted. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. it was, oh, yeah, it was more of a, it was more of a, a, it was more of a rich man's drug, whereas right. crack was considered more of a poverty kind of yeah, drug. Yeah, a street drug. Yeah, exactly. When you took crack for the first time, what happened? I got high as hell. <laughs> mm. And was did that become your drug of choice? Yes. Okay. And how are you getting it? Off the street. Okay, so here you are, this huge celebrity. It was easy on the for street. me to get. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. Did anyone ever recognize you when they were oh, selling yeah. to you? Oh yeah. Well, you look kind of familiar. Yeah, I didn't give a shit. Didn't give a shit. No. Well, by this time, how many kids did you have? Seven. Okay. And uh, you know, your daughter Brandy, she said that you were essentially an absentee father. I was absentee father to all my children. Yeah. I was on the road or out of my mind, one of the two. Well, you know, you said, I don't think I knew how to be a father. No, plus I, don't I learned think at I a very didn't. Yeah. You said plus I learned at a very young age when you get close to someone, they hurt you, whether they meant raping you or leaving you behind. So I didn't let no one get close to me. I didn't fall in love. I knew what happened when you fall in love, it would hurt you. That's right. That so, been my experience. You know, and you grew up in this family where your dad wasn't around. He didn't go to your games. He didn't go to your graduation. And I did he the told, same damn thing to my own kids. Yeah. You told yourself you would never do that yep. and ultimately. Yeah. How much of a struggle was that? It was horrible, man. I hated myself for it. 
you know, that's, that's where a lot of the self-hate was, was from, from, from the way I'd done things, you know, the way I let things roll out. Well, when you also talked about your kids, particularly your daughters, you said, I didn't make myself available to them. I was more of a court jester, and I was afraid that the demon my father had, which right. was young girls, would somehow manifest itself sure. in me. I didn't, I didn't want to take that chance. I wouldn't hold my little girls in my lap because I was afraid of that. Yeah. I was terrified. Yeah, I was. So because your dad was a pedophile with little girls, you were so worried that that might be passed down to you so that you would never actually put your daughters on your lap or kiss That's your right. daughters? That's right. But that was never actually a reality. No, life. it wasn't. Never. Mm -mm. But fear is, you know, fear has a hold of you, man. It doesn't let go. So you left the WCW and then you started to kind of move around the world. Yeah. Um, you went to Australia for a while. Uh, you went to Europe for a while. Yeah. You went to Japan. Yeah. Um, you ended up in Mexico for a while yeah. for the Mexican, uh, the Mexican wrestling association over yeah, there. Yeah, AAA. Yep. How's that experience? Oh, Just God. overall. Yeah, crazy. Mexico was like the wild, wild west, man. They still believe down there. And, uh, quite passionate. Quite passionate. Okay, and then by 94, you ended up at the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Association. Yeah, for like two or three events, that was it. Was New Jack around during this time? I don't, I didn't know him at the time. But I met him a few times. Well, yeah, I interviewed him before he passed. Wow. Uh, he was a real maniac in real life. Like, Yes, he was. This was not an act. This no. was this wasn't something he did with the cameras. Like yeah. the the type of, I mean, I, I remember we talked about. Remember that one that one time they slammed the guy from like what was it like thirty feet up? And I, I had never heard of anyone doing these types of things outside of him. Was he yeah. one of the craziest guys? Like in he the was profession? insane. He, he hurt. He hurt a lot of people. Yeah, he cut a lot of people. Yeah, well, he got cut himself also because his forehead was all, oh, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. Well, he done that to himself, up. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then by 96, you returned to the WWF. Yeah, for a short period of time. Right, the Royal Rumble. Yeah. And by that time, you were a born-again Christian. Yeah. Okay. What made you get you know more serious about your religion? Desperation, trying to find a way to kick the habit. I was, uh, I really tried to get clean then. I was fairly successful, not totally, but fairly successful at it. But my failures, again, would just overwhelm me. Each time I fell, you know, it, it would just devastate me. And it, it it was just crushing me. It really was. My addiction was crushing me. Well, your snake by this time was called Revelations. Yeah. And you had a match that year, 96, with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. How's that match? Went great. Went great, man. King of the Ring. That's uh, where the famous saying, Austin 316, came out of it. Right. Uh, after uh, Austin won, he said, you sit there and thump your Bible and you say your prayers. It didn't get you anywhere. Talk about your Psalms. Talk about your John 316. Austin 316 says, I, I just, just whooped your ass. Right. <laughs> right. And this started the whole attitude era yep. in the WWF. Okay. And... Uh, your next match was with uh, Jerry the King Lawler. Yeah. Pretty and, disgusting. Uh, I guess you made fun of his alcoholism? He made fun of mine, yeah. Oh, made fun of yours. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and he actually poured whiskey on you during yeah, the match. Yeah, he did, which uh, made for some tough feelings. Okay. Were you upset about that? You're fucking right I was. <laughs> what happened afterwards? 
I had a few words with him. Hmm. Okay. And then by 1997, you left the WWF again. Right. Okay, what happened with that? I just couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it anymore. I couldn't handle the addiction. I couldn't handle the lying. I couldn't handle the, you know, the... Just the whole scene was just too much for me. I couldn't deal with it anymore. And then you had a relapse of the drugs yeah. again. Yeah. And that's when I went off the deep end for, you know, a decade or so. Right, because your wife, Cheryl uh, Haygood, actually divorced you right, right around that time. Um, what was the final final straw in that situation? Alcohol and drugs. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Right. You know. So then by 1999, you got back into it. You got back in the indie circuit again. I had to feed myself somehow. Well, there was a match that you had with Bundy. Yeah. Where you were so drunk you couldn't even really stand up. Right. What happened with that whole situation? Uh, we were at a casino, and uh, I just got out of control. And uh, went out and made a total ass of myself, as we do. Well, that same year, the documentary Beyond the Mat. Yeah, which out. was bullshit. You know, I watched it this morning before the interview. Um, I mean, the part with your daughter, uh, that that was really, you know, kind of a very deep moment. You know, having her actually show up and talk about right. your past relationship. And, I, you know, it seemed that she really loved you, though. It seemed like oh, yeah. she really was was trying to make it work with you. Yeah, we have. We finally won. You know, she lives with me now. Oh, really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. That was your oldest daughter? Who was yeah, she works for me and lives with me. Okay. But in that same documentary, there was a scene in there where even though they don't show it, the, the narrator basically said that you, you went and smoked crack. No, well, that was a lie. Okay. He lied several mm -hmm. times in that documentary. Right. I heard you and a lot of people were upset over that documentary. You're damn right I was. Yeah. Was that the first time that the crack, you know, story was, was put into the public? I'm not sure. Okay. But it was still a big platform to actually put that out there. Sure it was. It, it made, he, he was trying to sell his movie. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about in that documentary how, you know, you wanted to be a father. And, you know, people ask, hey, you know, you're rich. Why not take off three months and just focus on your kids? But you said that, you know, working for Vince McMahon you had to work every day. And if you took three months off, you'd be fired. And the yeah. next person would come in. Yeah. Did that pretty much, I mean, and that didn't just apply to you. That applied to all Everybody. the wrestlers. Yeah. So were all the wrestlers struggling with the same family problems that you were going through? Sure they were. Yeah. You know, when I interviewed New Jack, uh, he was never in the WWE or WWF, no. but he ha he had some words about Vince McMahon. He called Vince McMahon a piece of shit, and he said that a lot of wrestlers died under his watch, and he never had to pay the price for any of it. It's true. Do so you agree with that? Yes. Okay. And I remember there was a, I forgot what it was. It was either Real Sports or 60 Minutes. It was that interview where... The interviewer actually confronted Vince McMahon about that, and Vince kind of like like hit him, you know, hit the the paper out of his hand. He was so upset. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, what's your take on that? Because it's not like anyone was being drug tested in the WWE, right? Not in the beginning, no. Okay. So I'm sure the steroid, you know, abuse yeah. was pretty heavy. Yeah. You yourself, did you take steroids? Yeah. Okay. What age did you start? Oh, probably 30. Okay, a little bit later on. Yeah. Was every other wrestler pretty much taking steroids as well? Pretty much. Okay. 
And with that came heart attacks, also came with roid rage and right. domestic abuse right. and suicides and right. everything else like that. You know, what did you see, you know, when it comes to the whole steroid oh, culture? It was fucking in insane, WWF? man. It was insane. But the guys that were doing the steroids were being rewarded. Yeah. You know, they were getting the top spots. The ultimate warrior, look at him. My God. He died at 50. Yeah. Too many guys have died, man. Way too many. Yeah. Well, uh, by 2005, at age 50, you actually came back to the WWE again. And that was when you uh, had the match with uh, Randy Orton? That wasn't a match. It was an interview. It was an interview. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And how was that whole situation when you came back again? Well, I came back and he was doing the thing where he was not knocking off uh, all the all the legends. So I went out to the ring and he basically tricked me, grabbed me, and did his finishing maneuver on me and left me laying. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. And that was it? That was it. Okay. And that next year you went to a total nonstop action wrestling. Uh, yeah, for a wedding. For a wedding, exactly. And uh, you got remarried again that year to Judy Lynn. Yep. Marriage number three. Yep. How's that marriage? It lasted six months. Six months? Yeah. <laughs> what happened there? Too much. She was too much. Hmm. She was just too much, man. I couldn't deal with her. She was crazy. Okay. And that was your final marriage at that point? Yeah, at that point, right? Except now yep. I'm about to get remarried. Oh, marriage number four now. Yeah. Right. To marriage to number two. Oh, to your second wife. Yeah, to Cheryl. Okay. Hey, I like it, man. You're a hopeless romantic, you know? Yeah, man. We've been divorced 24 years, and uh, we're more in love now than we were then. I love it. I Sobriety love it. does magic, man. I'm sure it does. Well, by 2007, uh, you actually performed at the Juggalo Championship Wrestling League. Yeah. Is that like a real league or is it just no. something that the ICP just kind of threw together? That's something ICP threw together. Okay. Um, how's that situation? Oh, it's horse shit. <laughs> Total horse shit. Okay. Well, uh, the WWE um, had a policy of actually paying, you know, former wrestlers who wanted to start rehab. Right. And you actually checked yourself into rehab in 2007. Right. It was a 14-week program. Was that the first time you were in rehab? No. How many times were you in before that? Twice. Okay, so this was the third time. Yeah. So you're checking yourself into rehab for the third time. Uh, do you think that this one made a bigger difference than the other two? No. No, because you, you weren't ready to stop yet. No. Well, that next year, you come out of rehab, and you had a show in Lakewood, Ohio. I guess before the show... You got drunk. You got drunk. There was 22 vodka bottles, little airplane well, vodka bottles. I don't know bottles. about that. Uh, I think well, that was I, really exaggerated. Okay. But you were drunk. I was. I made you a total know, so ass go, of myself. Well, right. Did they go book this legendary wrestler? Yeah. Jake the Snake. You come in, and 30 seconds later, you just pretty much just fall in the ring, and yeah. it's over. And... Um, you actually pulled your pants down, exposed yourself to the crowd. That's what I heard. You don't even remember that? Nope. Okay. Um, the police were called. Yep. You weren't arrested, though? Nope. And uh, TMZ reported on it. It yeah, said, yeah. Uh, Jake the Snake implodes. That's a, uh, that's a good word for it. Yeah. In the article, it said, forget everything you know about wrestling legend Jake the Snake Roberts. All that appears to remain is Jake the Junkie. That's, that's pretty rough. 
Did it hurt to read that? Yes, it still does. Yeah. Well, uh, that next year, uh, Jim Rose had uh, something called the Jim Rose Circus. Yeah. And you were part of that as well. Yeah, went out on that. Uh, how was that? I behaved myself on that one. Okay. It wasn't much fun, though. Wasn't much fun. No, Jim Rose is not. Uh... Oh, well. <laughs> Zip it up. Would... Well, uh, by 2012, you're, you're 57 years old. And you were, you know, in bad shape. You were actually 300 pounds. Yeah. How much do you weigh right now? 250. Okay, so you're 50 pounds heavier. Uh, you had problems walking. Yeah. Uh, you were living in a small, a small little house. Didn't have a lot of money. Didn't have much money at all. You know, you said uh, deep inside, I hated the fans because they loved me. I used to scream, how the fuck do you love me when you don't even know me? As crazy as that sounds, I didn't want anyone to love me. Uh, up up to this year, I didn't like myself regardless of my success. Even the highest point in my career, I still couldn't stand myself. And then I never thought I was any good. I never accepted myself as a great talent until recently. Um, so here you are, 300 pounds. You can't even really walk. And then Diamond Dallas Page ended up stepping in. Yep. And this was someone that really admired you, that really looked up to you. Yep. And he actually asked you to move in and stay with him. How was that situation initially? Amazing. You know, I didn't think I'd last a week. You know, because the rule was no, no drugs, no alcohol. But I moved in with him, and immediately he took control of my life and made me start doing things I didn't think I could do and kept me doing them. He kept me busy, kept my mind busy. Didn't give me time to think about using or think about getting high or getting drunk. Um, I moved in with him and uh, we were doing yoga of all things every day and an hour each day. And it's it made something click in my brain, man, is all I can tell you. Because I all of a sudden, after doing just a few weeks of this, I'd lost 15 pounds. And I look in the mirror, I'm like, holy shit, I can see a difference. Mm -hmm. And that was the point that it gave me something called hope back. Because I hadn't had hope in so many years. So many years. Well, yeah, I remember watching the documentary and... After you had moved in, at one point you disappeared and they found you at the Atlanta airport drunk. Yeah. And you didn't have any shoes on. I had one shoe. You had one shoe. Yeah. Sorry. What happened to your other shoe? I have no idea. No idea. Okay. And I remember that they were really like upset. Like, listen, like if you're going to do this, you're not going to be able to stay here. Right? right. But it seemed like after that, that was, you know, you got yourself together. Yeah. I slept three times, three different three different times in uh, three years. And each time I paid a price. But each time I got better. I got longer sober time. Now I haven't I haven't picked up in eleven years. And uh, I have no worry of ever picking up again. The thought of alcohol turns my stomach. Great. The thought That's of great. getting high turns my stomach because I'm high on life now. Well, I remember during that time, uh, you ended up hurting your shoulder. Yeah. And you didn't have insurance. Right. And the operation was like, I think around $10,000 Yeah, or so. GoFundMe. You did a, a GoFundMe and the fans, I think the first day they the first raised day. like 7000 like believe 7, it. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 uh wound up sending me about twenty two thousand dollars, I believe. Yeah. Good thing because it, the shoulder was more than ten, but that's the first time I really believed the fans love me, you know, and for all the right reasons. And 
that they would go to bat for me. And it just, I was, I was so, oh man, it just it makes me want to cry just thinking about it, man. How, how these people just laid it out there for me. You know, I didn't deserve it at the time. Well, yeah, you were actually crying when you saw it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. I mean, why does it surprise you so much that you have fans and that people love you? You had been doing it by that because time. Because I for... didn't love myself. Ah, right. You know, it took several years for me to get over that I hate myself for everything that I've done. Because Lord knows I did plenty of it. I left a lot of wreckage, but I survived all that. And I came out on top. And I give the glory to those above, man, because I couldn't have done it without him. Well, while living with Dallas, didn't you end up losing a black cobra in his house? Yeah, but that was years before. That was before. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was in the early early nineties. Uh, okay. <laughs> How do you lose a black cobra in someone's house? I put it in the bathtub. I came back fifteen minutes later; it was gone. Why would you put a cobra in the bathtub? Because it needed water. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. In 2014, at 59 years old, you were inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah. And Diamond Dallas Page was actually on the microphone. Yeah. How did that feel? Incredible, man. Because that was kind of the stamp that said I've made it back. You know, from everything I've been through, from everything I've done, I've made it back. That same year, though, you actually got diagnosed with cancer? Yeah, cancer on the back of my leg. Yeah. They had to cut it I, out. And they got it out fully? Yep. Yep. Right. You said, uh, if the devil can't defeat me, cancer doesn't stand a chance in hell. <laughs> True that. Uh, okay. You know, any time any time I have left on this planet, man, is is a gift. Because the things that I did and the way I lived, it's amazing that I'm even here. But I am. And while I'm still here, I'm I'm trying to help as many people as I can. Those that are in addiction, man, I, I love those people, man, because they're so lost. They're so hopeless, you know, and I just want to help, you know, as many as I can, like I said. Right, because in 2020, you got inducted into the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame Museum. Yeah. How did that feel? Awesome. Yep. Everything's beautiful, man. Yep. I've got yep. a beautiful life. I've got, got an opportunity to marry the woman of my dreams and uh, going to do it. And everything keeps coming up roses. Well, you said that I've got eight children. Four of them still want nothing to do with me. And I understand why, because right. I wasn't there. Right. So you live with your oldest daughter. Right. And three other kids you have a relationship with. Right. The four kids that you don't talk to, what happened there? The three kids. Three kids, sorry. Yeah. The fourth one... We just had a disagreement, that's all. But the other three, they don't want anything to do with me yet. But it's coming. It's coming. They're just waiting to see what I do. Okay. They're waiting to see what I do is real. You know, they love their mother very much. They're worried that I'm going to hurt their mother. But uh, that's not happening. Well, I mean, the fact that you managed to reconcile with your oldest daughter, who really, you yeah. know, based on the documentary, she had a lot of pain. Oh, like, yeah. you know, the whole fuck you daddy thing and, and all that type of stuff. I mean, you could, I mean, I, I cried a little bit watching that. So did I. Yeah. So did yeah. I. But, I mean, you've been 11 years sober now? Yeah. For someone who's watching this, and, you know, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who've had 
drug issues over the years. What do you think has kept you sober this long? Because 11 years is a very long stretch for someone with your background. Yeah, it's incredible. I think what's kept me sober is the joy that I'm having with this fresh new life. You know, where everything is good, where I like my, where I like me, and I like what I do. I like who I'm helping. I enjoy doing signings, man, and, and listen to these people's story, how I affected them in their lives, and when did they see me first? What were they doing? Was it with granddad or your dad or whatever, you know, just hearing these stories and watching their smiles. That's something I never experienced before. Well, yeah, I mean, you have eight kids. How many grandkids do you have? 11 so far. 11 so far. I remember watching the movie, uh, The Wrestler. Yeah. And, and I remember there was that scene when he was, uh, he goes to the autograph signing and he's looking around the room and there's guys in wheelchairs and leg braces and canes and everything else like that. And, and that's a real thing. This this wasn't just a movie. When you, when you look at all your peers, I mean, a lot of them have passed away, unfortunately. Right. The ones that are still alive, a lot of them are physically very messed up. Yep. I mean, is this a sport that people walk away from healthy? You know, I mean, for example, no. even, you know, yeah, like like Hulk Hogan. Like I I remember being at a, a wrestling match and they were saying that he was with a walker backstage. Yep. Like he could barely walk. Yeah. Um, when you look at all the all the guys that really did it, everyone walks away really messed up. Yeah. You know, it's, you it know. demands way too much. Now, your, your, your brother, well, two of your brothers ended up wrestling, right? No, one brother. One brother and a sister wrestled? And a sister wrestled also. And a sister. There, okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, but none of your kids wrestled? No, God, no. Okay. So, for anyone who's hoping to follow your footsteps to don't get into this it. profession, don't do it. Don't do it. And why is that? It's not worth the cost. The cost of, of of your physical being and the cost on your family. It's not worth it. Not not for everything that you have to go through. And a very, very small percentage make it. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm a one in a million shot. Right. I remember I did an interview with Mark Henry. And I remember in the interview, uh, I, I referred to wrestling as fake. And I remember he said that he wanted to punch me in the stomach <laughs> for saying that. Yeah, it's not fake. <laughs> I know, but it's predetermined in terms of the outcome. Yeah, yeah. We're foolish enough to allow each other to do things to us. I call it the theater of the insane. <laughs> the no, the, of no the, insane. the theater of the absurd. Of the absurd. Yeah. Okay. When you hear people say that wrestling is fake and so forth, mm -hmm. does that bother you? And does that bother most wrestlers? Nah, it doesn't bother me. Right. My skin's a lot thicker than that, brother. I mean, would you say out of all the wrestlers that did it, would you say that The Rock was the one that really walked away with the most success overall? Oh, of course. Yeah. No doubt. Right. I mean, not only was he a superstar wrestler, but he still seems like he has his health. Oh, he yeah. He doesn't seem like he's all messed up. Yeah, he does. Why do you think that he was able to walk away? Because he got out of it quick. Ah. He wasn't in it but a few years. Aha. Uh -huh. Was he in it five, six years? Right. He he made his name and then he went right to Hollywood. Right out of it. So that's the way to do it. If you want to do it, do it for a couple of years and then boom. Yeah, if you can. Right, because I remember I interviewed Ken Shamrock. Yeah. Right? Ken was a legitimate MMA champion. Right. Right? Like there's no, there's no getting past that part. And he said flat out that he hurt himself way worse doing wrestling than doing MMA. Yeah. And MMA, people are seriously trying to hurt you. Yeah. Whereas wrestling is supposed to be a show. Yeah. But, but yet. You know, if you're in MMA, you only do it what, once, twice a year? Yeah. In wrestling, you're doing it seven days a week. Why do you think that Vince McMahon pushes for that type of insane schedule? Because he can. 
just because he can. And greed. What kind of relationship did you and Vince McMahon have? No, we don't have a relationship. You don't have a relationship no. at all. Well, just recently, Vince McMahon had to step down from his position. Yeah, but he's back. Okay, right. Because, well, there was the whole $3 million hush money situation. Yeah, it's not the first happened. time. Oh, so you've been hearing about this happening before? Oh, God, yeah. Okay, how many instances have you heard? Three. Okay, so this was him basically sleeping with coworkers and yeah. and having to pay them off yeah. afterwards? Okay. But this is the time that he actually got caught. This is the time that it got outside the, yeah. The bubble. Yeah. Okay, when you heard about that, what'd you think? <laughs> go Vince, go. That's Vince. <laughs> Right. So because of that whole situation, he had to step down as the president of WWE. But then it was announced that what the Saudis are buying right. the WWE and he might come back. Right. Now, what have you heard based on your insider? I haven't heard anything else. Okay. I try not to listen. Mm. But you think he'll be back? He's back now. He's he, back now. He never left. He never left. Jake the Snake, man, it was truly an honor um, well, thank you. to sit, sit down with you. And just the absolute honesty uh, of your whole life. You don't try to sugarcoat anything. Nope. You're taking full full responsibility for Damn all straight. your mistakes. And uh, that's not something you see every day. Usually there's excuses and it's not my fault. It was this person or that person. But you actually place it all on yourself. And I think yeah, that I that's do. the reason why you are where you are right now being 11 years sober. Thank you. I wish you all the best, you and your family. Very happy that you and your daughter are reconciled. Yeah. And uh, man, I hope to see more great things from you in the future. All right. Take care, Take man. Care. Peace.